Hello, Buckeye fans, and welcome to another episode of the Bucknuts Happy Hour. I am Patrick Murphy here. We're going to talk a lot of football, some basketball today. Uh, we've been gone for a couple weeks. We had Ohio State on spring break, and then last week was just a crazy week with practice and pro day and basketball. So we're back, more on our regular routine. Drinking a little bat blue today, going to slow sip on that one. So we'll pour that out here and have a little mid midday treat. Um, our other midday treat is we're bringing in 24-7 Sports National College Football writer, Brandon Marcello. Brandon, how are we doing today? Doing well. I wish I could partake in the uh, afternoon sip. I, uh, yeah. I, I got to go to the gym later today, though, so... Guess yeah, that's what uh, a lot of the guests tell me. I'm beginning to think that I have the problem, but uh, well, <laughs> that's a different podcast, a different topic. Uh, Brandon, we wanted to bring you on to kind of give a national perspective of things as we're kind of in the middle of spring practice during the off season. I want to start with the Buckeyes. And while most of the people that are, they're watching this or listening to this are pretty dialed in to Ohio State, you obviously sit at a different perspective than myself, Dave Biddle, Steve Hellwagon. How do you view this Ohio State offseason, which has been a wild one with some of the additions brought in and coaching, transfer portal, um, but from your view, what, what do you see of the Buckeyes? What do you make of what they've done so far? Well, I mean, they've done everything they can to just show that uh, it's like national championship or bust, right? That's what it seems like. I mean, you're getting every single player you practically want in the transfer portal. You're getting every single diamond that's available in the jewelry store. Um, how can you not think that Ohio State is the best built team in the Big Ten and possibly the entire country? Um, and that that's a lot of pressure on a program at Ohio State where obviously we know what's happened against Michigan in the last couple of years and how that's all turned out. But, you know, outside of Ohio State and the Big Ten, I would say the only other roster that comes close to being built like theirs is Michigan. And it's very clear that they lost quite a bit. And they're breaking in a practically entire new coaching staff. Like, seemingly, only one thing's gone right for Michigan in the offseason. That was them stealing away an Ohio State assistant coach, as you guys know. But everything else has just been, like, bad news after bad news there. Uh, losing Jim Harbaugh, you you bump up Sharon Moore with the idea of, well, this will keep some consistency on staff, and it didn't. Um, the, new, the staff's practically all new. Um, and you've even lost a guy, a defensive line coach, that you pulled away from Wisconsin that was a really good hire who got busted by the police off the field for an incident, and now they're having to go elsewhere and look for another coach. So um, a lot of pieces there that have moved out, moved on, or have had been moved around. And... Outside that, it's like Ohio State to me, Ohio State, Michigan, Oregon, um, and maybe Penn State. But again, Penn State under James Franklin is just one of those programs where it's just like every year, just like, well, they're they're below Michigan and Ohio State. Um, and I don't see how they change kind of what the outlook was last season with the schedule they've got. And then also, I know everybody's excited about them bringing in Kansas offensive coordinator. I am too. I think he's efficient, creative, and getting guys open and stretching the field without necessarily having to stretch the field more often. Um, but you keep looking at Penn State and hearing everything coming out of there is we're running our Penn State offense. We're not really changing anything. So it's like, so why do you bring this guy in? Um, maybe it's to be more efficient. But to win the Big Ten, to win a major conference nowadays, you, you better be explosive and be able to hit plays down the field. And Penn State hasn't been able to do that. Ohio State will, and we know they will. But, um, again, that's just kind of how I see the, the Big Ten going into this, this summer right now. Ohio State is very clearly, to me, the best-built program right now. I want to get back to Michigan in a second, but what what do you make of teams being able to kind of load up like Ohio State's done? Um, and I don't just mean adding guys from the transfer portal. You obviously have the NIL factor that has led, you know, you mentioned Michigan. They brought a lot of guys back. 
two years ago to, to last year's team. And obviously that worked out. What do you make of kind of this new world of college football where you can retain and you can add in a way that we've never seen before? There's several models to kind of follow, but also there's, it's all about context of your program, where it's at, and then also the timing of everything. Some programs legitimately, like they're in IL collective, there's a lot of communication about the roster and what it's going at. And you're able to go, well, We've got what we have this year, but next year is the year for us to strike. We need to save up money that you guys have raised and use that going into next year. I know of several programs that are doing that and did that last year with the expectation of doing that for the 2025 transfer portal and a true 2025 recruiting class. Um, for example, the most recent one is Ole Miss this past offseason, all right? I know, you know, in Big Ten country, no one's wanted to talk about Ole Miss, and Ole Miss has not never even been to the SEC championship game. But they've got the type of depth there because of the transfer portal and how they've utilized it for the last two years to strike and make it into the college football playoff this year with the expanded field. They've got every offensive weapon you need, and they have reloaded. They lost Quinchon Judkins, of course, to Ohio State, but they've added guys all around him uh, at that spot. Defense is as stacked as it's been under Lane Kiffin. Um, they are spending money like crazy there in the transfer portal. And they know that this is their year because they don't have Alabama on the schedule this year. That the new SEC schedule with Texas and OU joining is very beneficial to Ole Miss this year. So they've been building to this year. Then you guys look elsewhere across the country, Ohio State, as you said, they're built this year to win the national championship. Last year, we thought they were, from the outside looking in, built to be a contender. This year, to me, other than Georgia, who's like a clear cut above everybody else nationally? Right. It's Georgia and Ohio State right now. Well, that'll, it'll be interesting to see if that's how it plays out. Let's go back to Michigan. You mentioned some of the the challenges that that the Wolverines are facing, losing Jim Harbaugh, that staff, the issue uh, with, with the defensive line coach. This is coming off a national championship run, and, and obviously there's been plenty of teams that haven't been able to, to put runs back-to-back -back, um, like we've seen with Alabama, with Georgia. But Michigan's kind of, you know, we'll see what it looks like come the fall, but sort of a fall from grace this offseason – yeah. What do you make of it, and what do you expect from the Wolverines in this new era under Sherrod Moore? You know, I, I, I think it's a big question mark. That They should be a playoff contender every other year, uh, even under a quote-unquote mediocre coach, which I'm not saying Sherrod Moore's that at all. What I'm just saying is that because of the talent, the history, the tradition, and everything they've already got there, I don't think it would have mattered what type of coach they got there. Even an average coach which should be able to get that team into playoff contention this year. But there's just so much outside noise. And I know last year they kind of thrived on that, and they fed off of it with the sign-stealing scandal and all that stuff and buying hamburgers and all that. I mean, <laughs> but they fed off that because Jim Harbaugh was that type of guy, just like, hey, you know, let it roll off his back. And he, and he just loved the players and built everything around him and rallied them. But a lot of those guys that he leaned on to kind of get them focused and avoid that outside noise are gone. And he's gone. And most of that staff's gone. And I think that Michigan's administrators tried as much as they can to keep that thing together by promoting more. I mean, it was a foregone conclusion. You're going to promote him to keep some type of consistency there. And that through line is pretty much gone now other than more. And I, I'm going to be fascinated to watch how that transpires and how that goes through this season. Because again, I, you know, the NCAA stuff that of course is going to keep bubbling to the surface there. Um, but you know, I, I, I'd be interested to kind of get the, the, you know, like a, a pulse check on Michigan fans. Are they, are they feeling like we won our national championship? You will never take it away from us. We are happy no matter what happens the next year or two, or do the emotions actually get involved this upcoming season? Say they lose one or two games by the time November rolls around, and they're like, this sucks. We want more, you know? Um, 
it'll it's going to be one of the fascinating stories to watch this year. Let's go outside the Big Ten. Um, who in your mind? You mentioned Georgia already, but who in your mind are the the haves coming into this season? Um, that, that you know, really, obviously, expanded playoff will change things some, but yeah. the teams you really think have the shot at winning it all outside of what we've already mentioned. Gosh, you know, you know, I was actually. I need to look back. I did like a, you know, one of those way too early top 25s. I actually yeah. call it my stupid early top 25 because it's really stupid to do a top 25 like before spring practices even start now because of the portal, uh, because you don't even know who's going to enter the portal on your own team, who's going to go to the draft or whatever. And I look at, I would look at it now and I would tell you, I'd probably, it'd be much, much, much different. But when I, I I'd almost have to go conference by conference at this point. There are teams that I think that maybe aren't getting enough attention yet because I know, one, what they have right now, but I also know what they're probably going to get when the portal opens back up on, what, April 15th? Yeah. Um, tax day and portal day. It's going to be <laughs> chaos. You better file your taxes so you can stay on your computer and your phone to keep track of it because there's going to be a lot of moves in the portal this April. I think unlike anything we've seen recently um, – there's going to be some wild stuff going on there. So I put all that into my little compartment, and I think, and I look at teams like Oregon, who I mentioned earlier about mm -hmm. being a Big Ten contender this year in the very first year. They've got it. They, they're they built kind of like a Big Ten slash SEC team in the trenches now under Dan Lanning. Uh, I really like Dylan Gabriel as a quarterback. He can be inconsistent at times, but – you know, I still think they're going to be an elite type team this year. Um, you know, elsewhere, I don't know if I see a team out of the Big 12 elevating and separating itself. In fact, I think you could argue all but one program, maybe two, in the new look Big 12 this year could win the Big 12 title. Because a lot of these teams are very much alike going into this year. Uh, the SEC, it's Georgia. Outside of that, you look around, Ole Miss, as I mentioned, their schedule is so conducive to winning 11 games this year for them. Going 11-1, and one, getting to the SEC championship game, and getting into the playoff. And with that type of offense, that is dangerous when you start playing in a playoff format. Um, you know, maybe an LSU... But again, it's like it's just like that one kind of thing there. It's like, is that just like a 10-win program for right now? And they just lost their offensive quarterback, Mike Denbrock, to Notre Dame. Right. And, of course, they don't have Jaden Daniels back at quarterback, but I really like Nussmeyer. Um, you know, I'm trying to – you know, I'm literally just going through the conferences thinking and looking down on things right now. But it, it's – like I said, it's like clearly just Ohio State, Georgia, and then like everybody else. But I'm really high on Oregon, and I'm really high on Ole Miss. And I'm very interested to see what some of these other bigger programs are going to do in the portal here in a few weeks and what they're adding. Um, and I'll say this, too, in the ACC, don't count out Florida State. I know everybody looks at that. Um, I actually talked to Mike Norvell today. Uh, they lost, twenty, by my account, 27 players off their two deep, right? Wow. They had 25 all-conference guys. We all know what happened last year, the playoffs snubbing them and everything, all the players opting out of the bowl game. But when we talk about transfer portal and the way things have been built, they have complemented their high school recruiting classes, which are top 10 every year pretty much, with one of the better transfer portal halls Every single year since the advent of the portal, it hasn't been up and down. It's been solid every year. Guys like Jared Verse, as we all know, the uh, prolific pass rusher, um, the receivers they were able to bring in. But they've also got guys from the high school ranks that they have developed that were five and four star guys that have been waiting behind these players that are going to finally get their, their shot this upcoming year. And Norvell was telling me, this is the deepest the program's been since he's been there they've got a top 10 roster right now and they got dj uyongalale at quarterback who i know everybody kind of throws in the mud a little bit for what happened at clemson but 
I, I just tell you, I hope you guys watched what he was doing at Oregon State. Yeah. That's a different quarterback. And now he's coming to Florida State with with uh, with fire burning under his ass after what happened at Clemson. He's back in the ACC. You know, look out for a program like Florida State to get back into that playoff hunt. Um, but again, it's going to be about teams that are deep that can, you know, you have to have to have some breaks go your way, and you got to be able to counterbalance injuries that you that come up through the season. Um, and you look at the rosters that can do that: Ohio State, Georgia. I would all, I would argue Oregon, Ole Miss to a certain extent. Um, those are the type of rosters that are going to be threats if they can keep it all together and live up to their expectations come December. What about Texas? I know that's the one that's gotten a, a good amount of buzz this offseason too. What what do you make of them? I I got questions up front for them defensively. Okay. Are they gonna be able I mean, listen, they're they're two <laughs> they're two tackles, Byron Murphy, legit. Those are the two best defensive tackles in college football, according to the analytics. When you just talk about getting the quarterback, wreaking havoc, and taking the pressure off of the other players around them, including the line, including the linebacker spots, I think that those losses are are probably not even overblown. You can keep blowing that uh, into someone's face because that those two losses are huge for them. Um, I really like Quinn Ewers, a quarterback. The receivers are are there. They got the offensive linemen there. Um. Let's see how they do week to week in the SEC. That's going to be different. Uh, sure. I know I know that just sounds like this stupid, common, stereotypical thing to say, but it's going to be different. And going week to week against linemen who are on your level every week, that's much different than the Big 12 because it is not like that in the Big 12 week to week comparing those offensive and defensive lines. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. I think a lot of people that I've read or heard talk about Texas haven't talked about, you know, it's a whole new world going to the SEC. Um, last thing I want to ask you to, before I get you out of here, obviously we mentioned earlier, college football playoff is expanding. How do you think that affects things both in the regular season as now you don't have to win every game if you're Ohio State or some of these other programs to get in, and then in the postseason as well where more teams are going to have the opportunities do we see more upsets in, in the postseason? What's kind of your view on how this changes things? Well, I think you're going to see some teams get in there that have no no, no place to be in there. Uh, I look at a team like Penn State in recent years, which 10-win Penn State would have easily been into a 12-team field, and they probably would have been killed. Um, they probably would have lost by a couple touchdowns against some of the teams they would have been met, met up against. So I think a lot of people sit there and go, well, yeah, you know, like a Liberty that would have got in or whatever, they're going to get, they're going to get blown out. Yeah. Yeah, right. sure. But there's also some power teams are going to get in there that have no business really being in there. When we talk about upsets. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I really, I'm really not sure because I, I think that this opens up possibilities now where, you know, Florida state would have been in a 12 team playoff. And whoever they face, they probably if they didn't face Liberty, if you know, depending on the seedings, they they probably would have been beaten in the first round and beaten handily, and it wouldn't have been you know really reflective of what they were able to do in the first part of the season. Um, I'm I'm for it, the expansion of it, of course, the twelve teams. I I do very much question what the hell they're exactly thinking with going to fourteen and trying to get multiple automatic qualifiers. Uh, for the SEC and the Big Ten, I, I mean, I understand why they're doing it. It's all yeah. about the damn money, the you know. Uh, but it, it, when we're talking about being fair and being, make, bringing this more open and being more transparent about it, it's anything but when we're talking about going to fourteen teams and getting automatic qualifiers. It's complete BS. It's a money grab, it's money chase. Yeah, um, it, it absolutely is. But I could sit here. Listen, every talking head is going to give their you put on this like this is what's going to happen there's going to be this percentage more of the upsets no one knows a damn thing till we actually see it all i know is i'm excited to see it because we're actually going to be able to see what would happen we haven't been able to see that yet real quick home games in the playoff 
How much does that change just kind of the overall look of things? We're so used to the bowl season and working with the Bulls to make this happen, and they'll still do that. But what do you think about these home games that we'll get to see at the end of the year? Oh, it'll be insane. Um, you know, I remember two years ago, three years ago, however long it's been, I remember talking to uh, uh, the athletics director at Florida, and they were talking about SEC scheduling all this, trying to figure things out. And also just with the playoff expansion, logistically, like trying to figure out like, all right, so we have like a, whatever it is, two, three week head start on getting our logistics together for hotel rooms, getting the fans here, you know, all of that. And at a place like Florida, which just has some amazing games there, he just straight up said, he goes, whenever we host our first playoff game at the University of Florida, it will be the biggest game in Florida history in the city of Gainesville. And I think that it's very difficult to say that would not be the case at a lot of places. Yeah. Other than say maybe Ohio state or Michigan or even in Alabama or in Auburn, which have tremendous rivalry games where there's been moments and everything that will never, the only thing that could pass that would be like a, a, a kick, a, a last second kick to win a national championship on your home field, which is not going to happen. Right. So um, it's there, there's going to be, it's going to be insane scenes anywhere, everywhere, but it's going to be, I, what I really, I'll say this. Okay. I, what I really hate hearing though, is people saying, what about the fans that are traveling? They're, they're going to go to the home playoff game, but they're not really going to travel to the, to the national championship game later. I'm like, that's complete BS. Play, teams, when your team gets a national championship game, the fans that were going to travel anyway are the ones going to travel. They're going to buy up and gobble the tickets. Yeah, it's an extra game. Yeah, but the, it's not going to. They're not going to sit there and plan things out and go. Okay, we're just not going to go to this game this year because we're probably going to play a home playoff game, or we're going to skip the home playoff game so we can go get in the national championship game tickets, or vice versa. That I. It's that weird – we're in this weird headspace right now in college football and college athletics where we do all this hypothetical thinking about worst and best-case scenarios because everything's so crazy right now that are absolutely ludicrous and just makes my – makes literally makes my brain itch when I talk here and talk about these things, especially when we're talking about NIL stuff and how much players are being paid and all this and what's the playoff field going to look like, how much money is everybody going to get. There's one thing I hate you know, in, in this space right now. And maybe it's just because the way I was raised or whatever. I hate talking about other people's money. And that's what this has all become. Yeah. How much is that guy getting? How much is this team earning? How, how much, but did they sell out their stadium? What are the TV ratings for them? Do they actually belong in this conference? Because they're not pulling in the viewership. I do not give a shit. <laughs> Play the games. That's what I'm here for. Give me the great storylines. Yeah. I do not want to talk about other people's bank accounts. That's not what sports is about. I, I don't get why we're in this space right now where we're obsessed with talking about that. Yep. Completely agree. Completely agree. I remember the first time Ohio State and Clemson played in the college football playoff, talking to some of the Clemson writers before the game, you know, the week before the game, and I'm saying, well, maybe a very big Ohio State crowd in – uh, Arizona because tech comes and fans are, you know, saving money for the national championship game. That stadium was packed. Both fans, you know, Ohio state yeah. fans travel like crazy and yes. they hadn't been in the playoff in a couple of years, I think at that point, but both fans were well rep or both teams were well represented. Uh, Clemson fans figured out a way to get across the country and watch their team play the Buckeyes. It happened. Imagine that. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> All right, Brandon. Well, thank you very much. I've kept you longer than I said I would, but I appreciate your time. And I think you gave some really good insight into kind of the big picture stuff in college football. So thanks for coming on. All right. See you, Patrick. See you later. All right. Thanks again to Brandon. Um, look, these uh, national writers, national talking heads, whatever you want to call a guy like Brandon, who if you don't follow Brandon, do it. He's all over along with Brad Crawford and Chris Hummer and, and some of our other national college football writers, um, which I want to have some more of those guys on. I know I've had Brad and Chris on before. Uh, as we get closer to the draft, Blake Brockermeyer, who's also been on, has done a great job with some mock draft stuff. So uh, I know most of you probably are Ohio State locked in and, and follow all of those of us who cover the team. But 
you're looking for a more national perspective, it's one of the great things about the 24-7 Sports Network is we not only have Ohio State, but we've got all these other schools and then obviously the, the national guys who are covering kind of the, the big picture stuff. But now I want to go smaller picture, get into Ohio State football this spring, especially since we've missed a couple of weeks here. Um, and just, you know, some of the some of the things that have stood out to me, we just wrapped up interviews after the Buckeyes, I believe their seventh practice of spring practice already. So about halfway through uh, the spring game coming up April 13th. And actually, while we're talking about the spring game, I was asked about this on a radio appearance I did the other day. If you missed it, the Buckeyes spring game is going to be on Fox on April 13th. Uh, noon kickoff, normal time, but Fox for the first time ever since they've been televising the spring game. And I don't even know how far back that goes. Um, traditionally, it's been on BTN, but for the first time, it'll be on Big Fox broadcast nationally. And someone asked on our message board, is this the first time anyone's had a spring game on uh, network television? I don't know the answer to that. I think the... Uh, I think Notre Dame's is usually on NBC. I could be wrong on that. I feel like at least, you know, maybe Alabama at one point during this, that run was on ABC instead of ESPN. I, I'm not positive on that. But the point being, this is a pretty big deal if you're Ohio State. Um, and not from a, a team perspective necessarily. You know, I don't think Jack Sawyer or Travion Henderson or anybody are going to you know, do anything differently because they are on Big Fox instead of BTN in the spring game, it's still a spring game. But I think it goes to show, you know, we're just talking to Brandon about the, the kind of national perspective of Ohio State. The expectation is that this is the best, probably, team in the country, collection of talent in the country. And they are expected to deliver on that after building this roster with the retention and the, the additions from the transfer portal. Um, the changes in coaches, everything, you know, to move, not move the game, but to put it on Fox instead of the, the spot it's been on BTN just shows that, that Fox believes the nation wants to see what this Buckeye roster looks like, even in what will be just a, a glorified scrimmage. Um, uh, you know, we've all seen Ohio state spring games for years. Often they are not exciting, you know, actual games guys are coming in and out what, doesn't matter. Fox believes enough people are going to tune in that it was worth putting it on uh, the, the main network. So I think that just goes to show what these expectations are for this team and, and kind of what they're going to have to live up to all next season. And look, it's expectations they're putting on themselves. The players have not been shy about talking about beating Michigan and winning a national championship in 2024. So it's nothing they don't know in the building, but I do think it's interesting. Uh, so let's hit on a couple things and uh, Jeremiah Reynolds real quick, Jermaine Reynolds, Reynolds, God, confusing people. I know uh, Jermaine Reynolds asked if we have paps. No, today we are drinking a Labatt. So uh, similar, but not exactly the same. Uh, all right. Quarterbacks. I think that's where everyone likes to start the conversation. I think I've said this before, but I've been surprised how much this is an actual quarterback competition. And look, Ryan Day has had, I'm using quotes for people that aren't watching, quarterback competitions before. But this is this to me feels like, it doesn't feel like Justin Fields when he first got to Ohio State or C.J. Stroud after Justin Fields left, where pretty much everyone knows who the starting quarterback is going to be. Look, I, I think it's going to be Will Howard. If I were going to put money on this, I would bet it would be Will Howard um, still, which is what I assumed coming into spring with you know him having one year left, transferring in from Kansas State. But from what we've seen, now we haven't seen a ton. We saw two 30-minute windows at the beginning of spring practice. We haven't been back in the building for a practice yet. Saturday will be Student Appreciation Day, so we'll get to see significantly more there. Uh, but – the bits that we have seen and from things that I've heard from people, Devin Brown has looked the part of a guy who can win this competition. Uh, I think Will Howard, it, it took a little bit of time to kind of settle in to new program, doing things differently, 
Uh, he even said when we talked to him after pro day, you know, getting used to throwing to these receivers that are, you know, just different than the receivers he had at uh, Kansas State. Going to take a sip here. Cheers. So, you know, maybe it's as much as just Will Howard needs to settle in and he'll start to climb, climb, climb and end up winning that job at the top of the depth chart. But like I said, I saw Devin Brown make some really good throws during those first two days we were we were able to watch some of practice. And I have heard some good things about Devin Brown. Now, Will Howard, from everything I understand, had a good scrimmage last weekend. Um, so maybe he is starting to, to find his rhythm in terms of the Buckeye offense. But I, I just don't think that this is a, you know, sure thing at this point that Will Howard is your set it and forget it starting quarterback for this team. I think Devin Brown is going to once again, make a push. And I know that doesn't sound exciting to a lot of Buckeye fans because he has been in the program a while and hasn't won the job, but just keep in mind, guy gets hurt at the end of spring practice. I think missed not only the the spring game, but the final practice, if I remember correctly of spring last year, pushes Kyle McCord into the season. At one point, I think most, there were some people out there that thought Devin Brown was going to win the job. He doesn't gets hurt during the season twice, including when he gets the opportunity to start. So like most people just haven't seen Devin Brown, who is a person or a player that, that the Buckeyes really like. Um, so, you know, it, it shouldn't be a surprise that he is pushing because he has the talent if he's healthy. Um, but we haven't gotten to see that, especially in games for fans. And so I think a lot of people start to say, well, he's just not the guy, well, you know, sometimes these guys come on later in their careers and he'll have that opportunity. If he can, he can keep this competition close or win this competition with, uh, with Will Howard uh, beyond those two. You know, I said it, I think on one of the last shows we did, uh, I would kind of group them as the starters, the, the two competing for the starting job, Will Howard, and uh, Devin Brown, and then Lincoln Keenholt kind of in a group by himself, and then the two freshmen, Aaron Nolan, Julian Sayan. I'd probably change that tune a little bit now. Um, Julian Sayan, by all accounts, has really come in and played well, which shouldn't be a surprise. He's one of the top-ranked quarterback recruits in the country. He got started early at Alabama, enrolling and taking part in some of their uh, pre-college football playoff practices, so he got some experience there. Kid's really talented. That's why uh, Ohio state was willing to take him in the transfer portal, knowing they already had another really talented quarterback coming in and Aaron Nolan. And, you know, maybe this upsets the apple cart a little bit. Well, it'll probably be worth it with, to have a guy like Julian say in, in that quarterback room. So not surprised that we're starting to hear some good things about him. Um, you know, Lincoln Keenholz is still a guy that they think can do some things as well. You know, this is his first spring in the program. So I think he's, you know, still, and he's, he's admitted as much still very much in the college development phase um, along with the two freshmen, even though he has a year more of experience. Aaron Nolan, I think is, is still um, getting settled similar to, to Will Howard, but without all of the experience of Kansas state getting settled into, to what is a big jump from high school football, especially last year where he wasn't throwing the ball a ton, did throw it a lot as a junior um, when he had Jelani Thurman and, and guys like that. I'm not saying to rule Aaron Nolan out uh, of anything down the line, but it does sound like Julian Sayan has impressed a lot of people in that building with what he can do, not just as a freshman quarterback who looks good at a little bit, but a guy that, you know, maybe can climb the depth chart higher than people expected. I'm not uh, the type to get overly excited about freshmen at this point, but you hear some things and put pieces together. It does sound like it's been a good start for Julian Sayan. So maybe I move him up a tier into that that group with Lincoln Keenholz competing to be, um, you know, at least on the the top three on the depth chart at quarterback. Um, the other big position that we've talked about a lot this offseason, offensive line. The right side of the offensive line was kind of more the question once we knew that Donovan Jackson was coming back and was going to fill in at left guard. Um, I guess you could say maybe there was question at left tackle because – Josh Simmons, while good as the year progressed last year, not the definite surefire guy. Cheers. I think, frankly, you could look at 
probably all five. I mean, Donovan Jackson going to be the starter at left guard, but um, you know, I think all five of those guys, there was a case to be made of, you know, somebody steps in and, and, you know, proves to be better. There's no locks at those positions, but it does seem like the right side of the offensive line now is where the biggest questions are, at least you know, coming into spring. Now, Ryan Day has talked up Josh Fryer quite a bit and talked about the offseason he's had. And, you know, he's the, uh, the, you know, the guard or the starting right tackle. I'm sorry. When we, when we were out there um, with Luke Montgomery as the starting right guard. I don't know if that's how it looks come next, the first game of next season against, I think it's Akron. Um, you know, I still think to me, Josh Fryer's best football was when he was playing right guard. I like Luke Montgomery um, as the, the right tackle personally. Um, but I also understand his athleticism and, you know, some of the things he can do might make him a better fit, you know, for a pulling guard and things like that. So I trust Ohio State will get that right. It's just, you know, maybe I just saw too much of Josh Fryer last season and I need to get that out of my brain because it was not good enough. And look, I'm a firm believer and these guys can develop. They can get better. I think people sometimes forget that and it's quickly, you know, guy has a bad season or a bad few games or whatever. And it's like, got to move on, got to find the next guy in the off season. And sometimes that's the case. But sometimes there's room for improvement. And and that could be true for Josh Fryer. It was his first time starting consistently last season. Um, but you know, for me, the two tackles, neither was of an elite level last year. And maybe Josh Simmons gets there with the full offseason now. Remember, he only arrived from San Diego State after spring ball last year. Uh, but it would not surprise me if the Buckeyes look in the transfer portal after spring practice, even if Josh Fryer is having a really great spring. Um, even if Josh Simmons is having a really good spring, I think, you know, if you can find an elite tackle to come in, that helps solve a lot of your problems. And yeah, that may upset some people on the offensive line and, you know, maybe a guy or two transfers, but Ohio State has shown this offseason to be di having a different approach to the transfer portal than they have as uh, at, in past years. So, you know, I, I am not sold still. And, and maybe as we see more, I will be more sold, but still, I think that that right side, I like Luke Montgomery. Um, I, I just, I, I'm hesitant to be like, yeah, just, just because Josh Simmons had a great winter in the weight room or Josh Fryer, excuse me, had a great winter in the weight room means everything's fixed there. I'm just not ready to go there yet though I do trust the coaches that he's he's had a good offseason thus far. I think if you move, well, I'm getting questions, a couple questions here. Jermaine Ronald's asked about center. Um, look, I, I think it's impressive that Carson Hinsman has gotten that sp spot back. I don't know if that's quite the right term, but was the starting center when we were out there, uh, the first team center when we were out there. Um, I still think Seth McLaughlin probably, well, I was going to say he probably wins that job, but I don't know. Carson Hinsman did it for a year um, and in this system. And while I know there were some issues, you know, it's not like Seth McLaughlin, despite being very good at Alabama, he had his own issues in terms of the snapping and of the ball and things like that. Uh, I am, I am unsure on that one, to be entirely honest with you. I think that uh, both of those guys have good, uh, good argument to be the starter. Again, we've only seen like small 30 minute windows, two of them. So it's hard to really judge Saturday will be a bigger opportunity for people to do that at, at student appreciation day. Um, and then obviously as we go through the rest of spring practice um, and then Robert at McIntosh, before we flip to defensive side, who do you like as running backs coach, man, that has become quite the, quite the situation for Ryan day. And look, I think, He's handling it well. Um, this was not a situation that anyone was expecting to get into with Tony Alford leaving early in spring practice, especially for Michigan. If this happens in January, when the rest of the coach, January, February, when the rest of the coaching stuff was, was taking place, cheers. I think Ohio State ends up with a um, Robert Gillespie or a DeMarco Murray or one of those top names that have been floating around. Um, 
But now you're trying to get a guy who's in the middle of spring practice to leave. And while that did happen with Tony Alford, not everybody is in the same situation of, you know, going into a final year of their contract. Okay. This school's offering me three years. You know, just, it's a weird situation. So I am unsure with where they will go at running back. Um, if you are a Bucknuts subscriber, I have updated with things that I've heard. Things have gone a little quiet now this week. And I wonder if that means maybe they're getting close on, on something, uh, but nothing that I have um, heard certainly enough to share at this point. I think Ryan day is, is willing to play this slowly because you, know, you don't need a running backs coach right now. I mean, ideally you you have your position coaches filled um, in spring practice, but you know, he's running the running back room right now. I think he's enjoying doing that. Now it will be weird if they go the entire spring without a running backs coach and then have to, uh, you know, bring somebody in post spring who's never worked with any of these guys. Fortunately, you are talking about an experienced room, Travion Henderson, Quinchon Judkins, even Dallin Hayden, uh, that, you know, it's not like they need a ton of, you know, hands-on coaching. Here's this, here's that. You know, these guys have been in big football games before. So you've, you've got a veteran room there, which I think helps. But, yeah, it's, it's a tough situation that they were put in here and not a clear path right now to, to the next guy. Um, which is unfortunate because I do think, like I said, it would have been much easier in January or February to have um, the guy you wanted or one of the guys you wanted, just like they did with offensive coordinator. All right. Defense, the, the kind of things that have stood out defensively. Um, I wrote about this on Buck Nuts a week or so ago. I came in concerned about what they would do at linebacker. Cody Simon obviously has, has played well. Was he ready to be the full-time starter? That's the expectation. Uh, but then who's next to him? Does Sonny Styles actually make sense at linebacker? I think we started to get some, some clear answers than I expected at this point in spring. Given, you know, CJ Hicks sounds like he's taken kind of the next step in his development heading into his third year. Sonny Styles has moved to linebacker. I was a bit concerned that that may be a, bigger adjustment to, to change positions. Uh, I keep using this, uh, this analogy for lack of a better term. Uh, it's not a video game, right? You don't just, you know, click a button and move Sonny Styles, the linebacker. And, you know, yeah, maybe his rating goes down a little bit, but he's still really good because it's a video game. No, like you have to actually learn this position. He's a person and whatnot. And while sometimes you can do that quickly, I mean, we saw, uh, we've seen it in the past, guys making quick transitions. Sometimes it takes a while. CJ Hicks, an example. Um, even Steel Chambers, moving from running back, obviously different than moving from safety, but you know, that took some time before he was ready to be a real contributor. So Sonny Styles has said he has kind of looked at the linebacker as the position he'd probably end up in, even when he was playing safety. So he has kind of started to understand the position more then maybe he would have, um, you know, without being taught it. Now he's actually being taught it. His dad obviously was was a very good linebacker for Ohio State. He's working with James Lornitis. He's working with Jim Knowles. So it sounds like this is moving in the right direction um, with him there. What's what, what, what will be interesting is that Jim Knowles said that it's not necessarily all the time that Cody, or excuse me, Sonny Styles and C.J. Hicks are competing against each other. Sounds like at times the Buckeyes plan to use Sonny Styles with the other two linebackers to be kind of a, a truer Sam linebacker who is athletic and talented enough to, you know, cover where they need and, and things like that. What that looks like, I'm on I'm unsure. Obviously, the, the most likely guy to come off the field in that scenario would be Jordan Hancock. Jordan Hancock was very good as the nickel last year, but I assume there will be times where it makes more sense to have a bigger bodied. CJ Hicks on the field, like last year. How much different is that from where he was playing the nickel than playing the Sam? Not a ton, I imagine, but there are probably some differences. Um, and then, you know, can he win the the will linebacker job outright against CJ Hicks? And then maybe moves to Sam at times when they need him to, and you bring CJ Hicks in. So I think while the most of my questions at linebacker seem like they're starting to be some answers early here in spring practice. 
I still think there are other questions that maybe have emerged and not that that's a bad thing. I think, you know, you're, you're creating options for yourself at that position. And look, there aren't a ton of questions on defense, right? You know, maybe the depth on defensive line, you know, are those depth guys able to step in and, and contribute at a level where you'd feel okay taking Jack Sawyer or JT Tuomalau or Tyleek Williams or Ty Hamilton off the field and, and you're not losing too much. You're going to need that. That may be really the only other question. When you look at cornerback, you know what those three are going to be. Denzel Burke, Davison Igbenosin, Jordan Hancock. Um, you know what they bring. You look at the safeties, Jordan Hancock, I guess, is a nickel safety, nickel corner, whatever you want to call him. Um, you know, Lathan Ransom back and healthy. You know what he brings. Caleb Downs, yeah, he hasn't played in this defense before, but guy was a freshman All-American. You know what he's going to give you, right? So really for me, like the these questions at linebacker, and I think they're starting to be better questions, easier questions to answer maybe than, than they were as we got into, as we started spring practice, which I think is a positive, but they still need answered. You still need to figure out who the starter is next to Cody Simon and, you know, how you use CJ Hicks, um, you know, Sonny Styles, and, and then maybe anyone else that works their way into the mix as well. We've heard good things about Arvell Reese. Gabe Powers seems to be coming on a little bit. You know, they, they haven't rotated much at linebacker in the past, but, you know, maybe you do as you go through things. Um, yeah, so it'll be interesting to, to see how that all plays out. A um, couple other questions I saw thrown here. Robert McIntosh, do you think the defense will blitz more since our DBs are so good? I talked about this shortly after the season. So Jim Knowles, that first year as defensive coordinator, aggressive, um, you know, you, taking chances at times, and he got burned in some big games. And, you know, he talked about if you give up X, you know, three big plays or fewer, you're going to go undefeated, I think is what it was. Well, that didn't work so well when you're, you know, playing Michigan, playing Georgia, um, you know, even with an explosive offense on the other side. So last year he goes to the other side, very little blitzing, um, you know, kind of keep a shell in the defense, keep everything in front. I think that there has to be a, a nice blend of the two calling, you know, the, you can still try and keep things in front, but I do think you have to be aggressive at times. And that's not to say they weren't aggressive last year. There were some bits and pieces of, of times when they were aggressive, but it wasn't as much two years ago. So how can you find a happy medium there where Jim Knowles can still kind of trust his gut and be aggressive, but maybe not as aggressive or, or, or find some answers um, when you are aggressive, you know, you just don't want to get burned that but by, by some of those plays as they did um you know in the or in the uh peach bowl against michigan things like that and you know look even when you did have a sound uh keep everything in front of you defense still lost to michigan you know as we talked about earlier still didn't beat georgia even though the defense played as well as it could have been asked for so you need to find ways to to mix things up i think a little bit Maybe not quite as much as Jim Knowles did his first year, but a nice blend between these two seasons that we've seen out of Jim Knowles. Um, okay, I want to take a few minutes to talk about kind of the end of the college basketball, Ohio State bas college basketball season, start of this off offseason. Um, cheers to a better ending than I think a lot of us thought it was going to be for a while. Um. All right, you know your coach, Jake Diebler's the guy. I think, as I wrote, and you can read it on Bucknuts, uh, I wrote it last weekend, I believe, there's a bit of a risk here, right? You you decided to not swing big and go with an experienced coach or even swing medium and go with, you know, a Dusty May or, or someone similar who's had some experience, maybe made a run in a tournament, things like that. You went with Jake Diebler, who... Been in the program, hopefully brings you some continuity, but you are not uh, you are not getting a guy who has any type of experience of being a head coach. I'm not saying it was the wrong decision. I like Jake Diebler a lot. I've talked to him about basketball, about a lot of the things he's going to have to do. I think that makes a lot of sense. 
But I also think that there will be bumps in the road with Jake Diebler as he learns what it takes to be a college basketball coach. And he's doing it at this level. And, you know, I've had some people say to me, well, you know, Ryan Day, Ryan Day took over for Urban Meyer in a program that was one of the top five best in college football, even if they didn't make the college football playoff that year. This is a program that now needs a rebuild. And you're going to do it with a guy who is learning on the fly, as opposed to Ryan Day, who was learning on the fly, but with a really good roster and some really good coaches around them. So I don't think those two things are comparable. Then Michigan goes and hires Dusty May. Now you're going to see these two compared to each other for the next however many years that these guys are both on these staffs. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting, but good run to the end of the season. I was of the opinion that like the NIT run was fine. I was ready for it to get done and let's get started on the off season. Let's get started on what's next uh, for the Buckeyes. And now here we are. Ohio state loses to Georgia Eerily similar to the college football playoff semifinal uh, a couple of years ago with kind of the way that game ended with Jamison battle, getting a, a three to win the game. Uh, didn't hit it, but now you look at the off season. All right. Question one, how many players transfer as of the time we're, we're doing this? Only one guy has entered the transfer portal. That was Bowen Hardman who played in 18 games and didn't average a ton of minutes. A guy who I thought should have been on the court more, I asked both Chris Holtman and Jake Diebler about him and got some like coach speak answers about, you know, he needs, we like what he gives us. He just needs to keep working. Clearly there was something not right there because that's a guy who can give you some shooting, seem to be doing the things you need to do defensively and still couldn't get on the court. So completely understand him wanting to find a better uh, situation, but is he the only one? How many guys do the Buckeyes want to retain from this team? Um, as I said on Instagram Live I did yesterday, look, I I think if you're Jake Diebler, you probably want to keep this roster as much together as you can. But I also think you have to realize that it wasn't just Chris Holtman that were was an issue. I mean, there were players that didn't perform as well. you know, And even after they go on this run with Jake Diebler, I think you have to look at it and say, you know, who – who is who is needed on this roster in 2024, 25 and make some serious, you know, not that you're cutting guys, but have some serious conversations because it's not like, again, with, with football, you're taking over this loaded roster. You're taking over what should be a good roster that has probably underachieved the last two years. But, you know, I think you have to, okay, if this guy's thinking about the transfer portal, how much effort are we putting into keeping this guy over this guy? And, you know, now you're, probably using NIL resources. So where does it make sense to spend that money? Not that Ohio state is directly involved in that, but with the collectives. Um, so I think they need to decide who are the priorities uh, to, to make sure they keep, you know, I think Bruce Thornton, I think Roddy Gale, I think Felix Akpar all make sense to be uh, in this program going forward. If you, if you can make it happen. Uh, but those decisions need to be made. Then, the players have to make their own decisions, right? Um, people are going to be coming after these, especially these sophomore class, going to be junior class to, you know, behind the scenes, you know, to, hey, if you enter the transfer portal, this, this, and this. It's already happened. Uh, last year, there were people after some of Ohio State's freshmen trying to get them to, to enter the transfer portal after their first year. So these players are going to have to make a decision about, okay, do I want to play with Jake Diebler? Do, you know, is Ohio State the right place for me? Is there a better opportunity elsewhere where there's a, you know, maybe there's a clear path to playing time and I can be part of, you know, a team that's almost certainly going to make an NCAA tournament? Because, look, yes, you know Jake Diebler is going to be your head coach, but you don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah, we've got a, you know, eight, nine, whatever it was, game sample size here with the end of the season, the Big Ten tournament, the NIT run, but, you know, it what – was that the new coach bump or was that what you expect from Jake Diebler going forward? The players will have a better sense of that than, than any of us, but those will have to uh, be decided as well on their side. Then the coaching staff. Okay, Jake Diebler lost Jack Owens. He went and joined Chris Holtman at DePaul. He brought brings in Dave Dickerson, which has been met by 
some pretty negative reaction. If you, at least if you look on Bucknuts and the front row, um, you know, Dave Dickerson was a part of some really good Thad Mata teams, but was also part of the decline of the Buckeyes under Thad Mata. I think, and from what Jake Diebler said, this makes some sense in that you have an experienced coach, guy who's been a head coach coming in to help Jake Diebler, and a guy who cares about this program, has been a part of this program before. Uh, excuse my dog. There's another dog across the street. Um, so I think there is some sense. I get why Jake Diebler did it. But I also get the apprehension. I remember Dave Dickerson towards the end of the Thad Mata, you know, experience. And there were concerns about Thad's assistant coaches and their recruiting and things like that. So I, I think it will be interesting to see how else Jake fills out this staff. Um, you know, there's been talk about, you know, could another coach, Mike Netty, maybe go to join Chris Holtman. I think they have another uh, spot on that staff since Jake Diebler stepped up. I don't think it can all be friends or past coaches. I think you want new ideas in there and, and whatnot. It's going to be up to Jake to, to find another coach or two, depending on how he, he sets it all up to come in and maybe bring some, some different uh, differences of opinions and whatnot. So all of these questions should be answered here relatively soon. Um, you know, the college basketball transfer portal is open for about another month. These guys, you know, all of the Buckeyes decided to stay through the end of the season. They could have hit the transfer portal as soon as uh, Chris Holtman was fired a little over a month ago. They stayed. They saw out the season. I think that's a positive sign. Uh, but I also don't think everyone's going to be back. I think there will be opportunities that guys are going to jump on. Uh, you know, I've already started to hear rumblings about guys at least considering the transfer portal. So I think we'll know here pretty quickly on on kind of what that looks like and then Obviously, Ohio State will have to hit the transfer portal itself. I believe they only have uh, now, I think it was one scholarship open coming, you know, if you include the two incoming um, freshmen, the, the Junie Mobley and Colin White, who will be here this summer, that they only had one scholarship open with Bowen Hardman leaving. I think that's two. My math could be wrong there, but um, it's, you know, not a ton of scholarships open. So you have to decide where you want to prioritize when you do go into the transfer portal. Uh, Jermaine Runnels asked, does Michi come back? Michi Johnson, who played for Ohio State, then went to South Carolina the last two years, has really become a, a pretty solid player for, for the Gamecocks and now is in the transfer portal again. Um, I think there's some reason to think that fits, and I don't think the door is completely closed on that. But if I'm Ohio State, I'm prioritizing Another Jamison Battle type of guy, if you can find that, the, the power forward um, type, you know, guy who can play the out, play from the outside, can shoot the ball, but also big enough to rebound and battle with Big Ten, other Big Ten bigs, um, you know, and can score inside. I mean, I think that should be your priority when you're looking at the transfer portal, um, you know, even maybe uh, an upgrade at the at the three spot. Yeah, I know you have Devin Royal who could be, um, you know, should take a step next year, could play that, but you, know, you need shooting, uh, you need defense. Evan Mahaffey was the starter there. I assume Evan Mahaffey will be back, but he had some good moments, some, some really good moments actually throughout the season, just consistency. And, you know, you're going to need more from that position, I think, to be a really good team. I think Evan Mahaffey, and even a young Devin Royal are probably rotational pieces that can grow into something bigger on really good teams in the Big Ten. And so could you go find a three and a four in the transfer portal that, you know, assuming you keep the rest of this, most of this group together, can you find a three and a four in the transfer portal that can make a difference um, with, you know, those at those spots? I think that's how I would prioritize it if it were me. But I'm not Jake Diebler or anyone on that staff. So, you know, I'm just uh, I'm just spitballing. But that's kind of where I stand with the basketball program. I think there's a lot of questions that need answering. I'm excited to see where it goes. Not that I wanted the season to end. I was enjoying covering the NIT. And I think it would have been fun to go to Indianapolis and, and see the Buckeyes play at Hinkle Fieldhouse uh, where Butler plays. But at the same time, I think it's time to – Time to jump over and, and let's get into off-season mode and, you know, start to see what the future of this, this program looks like. Um, from a scheduling standpoint, 
for those who haven't paid attention to what the schedule looks like for the football team, um, Student Appreciation Day Saturday. You will see a lot of stuff from that. Students will be tweeting out things, I imagine, as the Buckeyes held practice and scrimmage. We will be there. I will not be there. I've actually never covered a Student Appreciation Day, and that's not my choice. Uh, For whatever reason, it always tends to be a weekend that I have previously scheduled something. I have the same situation again this weekend. I'm going to be out of town. So you can follow my journey if you want on my Instagram. But Bill Curlick's going to step in to, to be down there for me, along with Dave Biddle and Steve Hellwagon. So they will have plenty of stuff from that. I'm excited to talk with them about what that all looked like and, and kind of hear how things looked. Um, uh, after that, we go back to, I think, Monday, Wednesday next week for interviews. So that's kind of how it'll work going forward here. Um, spring game coming up quick. The day before the spring game, we have another open practice. We'll get to watch the full thing. So we'll have two-day window there of of a lot of Buckeye viewing. In terms of the basketball team, my hope is, and and I talked to Gary Pettit, the SID, for the men's basketball team, I'm hoping that there is more availability this summer than there was last year because I do think there's a lot to talk about with this team, especially as we do kind of answer some of those questions. So I think we'll be able to stick with this Buckeye basketball team as they build um, what will be the 2024-2025 team. Anyway, I'm pushing on one of the longest Bucknuts happy hours we've done. I want to say thank you again to Brandon Marcello from 24-7 Sports National Side of Things for coming on, talking some college football, big picture stuff early on. If you missed that from the live show, go back and listen on the podcast. Uh, Please like, subscribe, whatever platform you're on. Uh, Turn the notifications on on YouTube to get all of our stuff. And uh, we'll be back next week to uh, kind of flesh out what happened at, at at uh, Student Appreciation Day and anything else that's gone on in the world of the Buckeyes. Anyway, cheers, Buckeye fans.